If you were forced to play in a deadly tournament where winning could make you a trillionaire, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death game in Zero, the bravest money game. This man is about to become the most powerful person in Japan. Ray here is in class teaching his students, and they all think he's an ordinary school teacher, but they have no idea he's actually a vigilante known as Zero. This thief is famous for helping people get back their stolen money, and soon he'll be forced to survive seven brutal games or die trying. Meanwhile, Zero's friends have been caught stealing money from a group of gangsters and are being kept alive to bait their leader. They're about to get killed when suddenly a man walks into the room and it's the thief Zero. He's come to to save them, and demands the gangster release his friends before pulling out a sake cup with the symbol of the powerful Yakuza group these gangsters are working for. He threatens that if they don't comply, their criminal operations will be revealed to the world, and terrified of being exposed, the gangster lets them go. Just as the thieves are about to leave, this woman arrives out of nowhere and reveals her boss wants to talk to them. That's when an old man is wheeled into the warehouse, and the gangster immediately drops to his knees, paying his respects. This is the chairman of the Zaizen group, the most powerful man in all of Japan, and he has come to buy them as slaves for a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, but nobody realizes they're headed for a brutal death game. They're all taken to an amusement park, where the woman announces all the men below have been selected to play in a ruthless competition, where the winner will become the new chairman of the Zaizen group. To sweeten the deal, the assistant explains that the winner will receive 100 billion yen, and a tarp is pulled off a cage in front of them, revealing the prize money. The players get into a frenzy, excited about what they could do with that much cash, but Zero here is suspicious. There's more to this than they realize, but before he can say anything else, the assistant announces that the first game is about to begin. The curtains behind them are dropped, revealing six giant cages with a numbered die hanging above the entrances, and it's terrifying. They all watch as the woman throws her dice into a bowl three times, and the players notice that it always lands on one. On the last throw, the woman closes the container and reveals to the men that they need to figure out what the number is, asking them to guess by using their observational skills. They must enter the corresponding cage of what number they guess, but if they choose incorrectly, this giant iron ball will drop on them. Anyone who shares their answer will be disqualified, and they have only 30 minutes before they need to make a decision. With that, the woman bangs a gong, and a timer starts counting down to their deaths. Okay, this is horrifying. We've just been kidnapped against our will and brought to a death game where everyone is playing for the chance to stay alive. The problem is that this game is not as simple as it appears. After explaining the rules, the woman told the players that they must use their observational skills to find the right answer, and this is a huge clue because she didn't say anything about needing to be good at math. If the solution can be discovered by basic observation, then it's fair to assume that it has less to do with statistics and more to do with understanding the reason we're here. If it were me, I would first think about what the game is designed for so we can figure out the right way to solve their puzzle. These people have created this competition so that they can find a new chairman from the wealthiest company in all of Japan. Not only will they win 100 billion yen, but they'll also be in control of their entire business operations. This is so much money, it makes a squid game pick Piggy Bank looked like a carnival prize, but there's one problem. If we're taking it at face value, this game is mostly based on luck, and there's no way you would want someone who's just lucky to influence a company that took decades to build. With this much at stake, they don't want a lucky winner, they want a competent winner. And that means it's most likely the solution here is not about randomly choosing the right cage, but about how to hack the game. Now, the woman told us to be observant, but she made one huge mistake. Earlier, she smashed this cat statue to demonstrate what would happen if we lose, and it's definitely terrifying, but it also gave everyone in the room a clear strategy to survive. Anyone who's looking at this should immediately be thinking about their own survival, so when the ball comes down, it's impossible to ignore that there was an entire perimeter of space around the cage. We obviously want to try our best to figure out which cage is safe, but as an extra precaution, I would lay down and stretch myself across the edge of the cage to minimize the amount of space I'm taking up. We could even stick our arms and legs to the bars to make sure they aren't in the way, and guarantee that we don't get crushed if we happen to choose the wrong answer. The players are paralyzed with fear, and this nerd Hiroshi realizes that they have an 80% chance of death no matter which cage they pick. Interrupting him, this gangster Segi thinks he's figured out the answer, but the thief knows there's something suspicious 
suspicious about what was shown on screen. This gangster Sakura points out that the previous rolls were all ones, and it's so unlikely that it could mean the die is loaded. Nobody knows what to do. So the assistant decides to give the players a hint, telling them that anyone who gets in a cage will be allowed to pass if they manage to survive, even if the answer is wrong. That's when the student walks straight through the crowd and enters the cage with a number one on it. Nervous, the other players follow after him, but the thief stays back. He's certain this must be a trick, but as he tries to figure out the answer, his friend decides to join the others. The thief thinks about the woman's hint and realizes this is the key to solving the puzzle. She also never said that the screens were showing the same dice that were thrown into the container, and it becomes clear that they were actually playing a pre-recorded video. He warns the boys the correct answer isn't one, and overhearing him, the other players players immediately run out, terrified of getting crushed to death. Taking time to think, the thief has a clever idea and sits down in cage number two, insisting that his friends follow. Realizing he's discovered the answer, they sit next to him, but that's when this man scolds the thief for giving them false hope and walks away in frustration. There's only five more minutes left until the balls come crashing down, but the thief notices this student is still sitting inside the first cage. He asks him why he hasn't moved, and the kid answers that to beat this game, they have to treat it like picking money off the ground. It's a strange clue, but Seiki here suddenly realizes how he can survive and tells his partner, as the assistant announces there are only three minutes left. With time running out, he makes a plan to guarantee nobody else can compete with them and suggests they use this player as bait. Inviting him over, they lure the man inside the third cage and tell him to wait here, explaining they have insider knowledge and will lie to the others to eliminate the competition. That's when one of the players asks to be let inside, but the gangster tells him they're intentionally trying to kill this man as punishment for stealing from them. It scares the others off, but the thief refuses to let the kid throw away his life and insists he's being tricked. With only one minute left, the crowd rush into the fifth cage while the gangster takes cover in cage number four, and the thief decides to risk everything to save his friend. Climbing out of the cage as fast as he can, he leaps through the air and joins the man in the other cage. It takes them all by surprise, and he immediately tells them to tuck in his knees as close as possible. That's when the assistant opens up the container, revealing that number four is the correct answer, and the balls drop down in all the other cages. All of these players manage to survive by staying against the wall, but the people who ran into cage number 5 have been crushed. It's a brutal death, and that makes one game down with six more to go. Okay, this is getting interesting. Tons of people just got squished to death by this giant ball, but if any of them were listening carefully, they would have realized the woman was telling them exactly what to do. Earlier, she stated that even if they choose the wrong answer, as long as they survive, they can pass to the next round. Then the student immediately walked into cage number one and sat down with his legs tucked in. Observing this, Zero realized that based on the woman's hint, it's possible to survive the game inside of any cage we pick. If that's the case, then we don't need to waste time finding the right answer, we only need to make sure we don't get crushed to death. Now, if we're being realistic, it's such an obvious solution that if we sit down too early in the game, we can expect other players to copy the strategy, and that's why this student was making the wrong decision. The smartest thing to do is wait until the clock is running low before making our move. The less time there is, the more people will make decisions out of fear and panic, and that's exactly what we could use against them. That's why if they were me, I would wait until the last minute to tell everyone I figured out the answer. At this point, the group will be desperate for anything that sounds true, so I would explain to them that the only reason the woman rolled her die three times was to confuse us. We only needed one example to understand the game. So once we realized that the three rolled ones were a trick, then the right decision is for everyone to ignore the pattern completely and trust their own instincts. We've all been handpicked by the game designer because they think one of us could be their next chairman. So it's more likely they're looking for a leader who trusts his own instincts instead of overreacting to fake patterns. Now it's fair to point out that it's against the rules to share your answer with anyone, but as long as I can influence the players without explicitly telling them which cage to go in, then I'm not breaking the rules. This way, I can use the last minute of time on the clock to make them focus on their own mistakes instead of observing what I'm doing. Then I'll have time to set myself up against the edge of the cage, and everyone who hasn't noticed will get crushed, eliminating as much of the competition as possible. Now, there's one more observation I have to point out. Zero here was incredibly smart, because he was paying attention closely from the very beginning. When the woman rolled three ones in a row, in person, Person, we can see that she tosses it with the same hand on this side of the cup, but in the video, we can clearly see that it's being thrown from the other direction. 
This is a dead giveaway that these videos were pre-recorded to throw off the players, and even though Zero didn't realize it immediately, he trusted his instincts and figured out that it was all a trick. With the challenge over, the balls are raised and the winners are let out of their cage. Even though this guy revealed the answer and broke the rules, the Game Master chooses to allow him into the second round, but it's about to get a lot more deadly. The next morning, the survivors find themselves in front of a massive hotel, but they're not the only ones playing in the next round. A mob of other players have gathered in front of a stage, and they start complaining to the staff members there's too many people competing, but the assistant ignores them. Instead, she announces that over 20 challenges have been prepared, and this time, they'll get to decide what to play. If they win, they'll be given a ring, and the first person to earn four rings will be rewarded 100 billion yen, along with the right to become the new chairman. Each venue will have a sign in front, indicating how difficult it is, and the harder the challenge, the more rings they can gain. The thief lines up in front of a venue, when all of a sudden, a player tries to cut in line. Furious, the men start fighting each other until someone stumbles out. Zero checks on him, and is shocked when he realizes the kid's tongue has been ripped out of his mouth. It terrifies the players, and the best thing they can do is look for a safer challenge. Later, they enter one of the buildings, and find two more groups have already gathered inside, listening to the chairman speak to them. He explains that the only two people with potential to be the new chairman are the student Shirube and the thief Zero. He wants to test their abilities now and will pay the price for their participation. The old man reveals they will play a game called Quarter Jump that has a 75% death rate, but if the player survives, everyone on their team will get two rings each. The others celebrate, excited they'll be able to pass this round, but the old man makes it clear that turning him down is not an option. That's when the guards suddenly put masks over the players' heads and lead them to the next venue, but this challenge will be more dangerous than the last. Later, the thief is taken to an elevated platform and is told he'll be allowed to look around the room for 10 seconds before the mask is put back on. With that warning, the guard takes it off and he realizes there is one platform that leads to the exit, while the other three are blocked off by metal walls. If he jumps in the wrong direction, he'll fall to his death, but the mask is put back on and he's left alone as the platform starts spinning around. There's no way he can remember where the safe zone is, and to make things worse, he's not allowed to throw anything to check if there's a wall in front of him. The only way for him to to win is by jumping on the correct platform, and if he takes longer than the student to make a decision, then he will lose. But that won't be the only challenge. There will also be four people standing on the other platforms trying to convince him to jump towards them, but only one direction is safe. If he falls for the trick, that player will get one ring, and with all the rules explained, the timer starts counting down for 10 minutes. Okay, this place is a nightmare. All the players have been moved to an island where they can literally pick what game they want to play, as well as the level of difficulty. It's like if Alice in Borderlands created a real-life theme park, but there's one problem. We can expect more of the players to try collecting all four rings by playing four easy games, but this would be a huge mistake. If you enter a less challenging game, not only do they get fewer rings, but you'll also have to risk your life more times than if you were to just try a harder level. That's why the smarter approach approach is to find two intermediate challenges that offer two rings so that you only need to play twice. Now, we don't know what level this game is, but if it were me, I would be freaking the f out. First of all, this leather mask might be worth auditioning for the next Fifty Shades of Grey movie, and that's just bad for everyone. To make things worse, we can't see where we're going, and three out of four people will be trying to trick us into falling off the edge. There's only one safe direction, and we have no way to figure out what that is without some very clever tactics. Now, earlier, the chairman gave us some coins, and you might be thinking we can throw them at the walls to confirm which direction is dangerous, but this would instantly get us disqualified because it's against the rules. Another idea would be to place a coin on the edge that's facing the safe zone before they put the mask back on. This way, we could use our sense of touch to find it, confirming where the safe zone is. The problem with this strategy is that the entire platform spins, so there's no way to use what we've seen to get our bearings. With only 10 minutes to make a decision, and four different people trying to convince us which direction is safe, we'll have almost no time left to figure out whether or not they're lying. That's why if it were me, I would completely ignore the other players, and instead of throwing something to make a sound, I would throw the sound itself. If you look here, you can see that the walls are not close enough to touch with our hands, but they're still close enough that we should expect to hear and feel sound reverberating back from them. With this in mind, I would slowly walk to one of the edges and clap my hands, listening carefully to the ambience. Then I would move to the next edge and use the same tactic, and if the ambience sounds larger, then the sound waves are traveling further away, meaning this is the 
the safe platform to jump towards. Without our sight, there's a risk we might misinterpret the reverberations, but it's smarter to find more ways to trust our senses and use the information to support our choices rather than just listening to other players who might want us dead. That's when the man hears the nerd Hiroshi insisting he jump towards him. Suspicious, the thief asks him questions about their shared past, but the kid manages to answer them all correctly, and it seems like his friend is really standing there, but he's about to fall for their trick. On the ground floor, the other teams are watching the game when the real nerd enters the room. The voice on the platform is an imposter, and the thief is about to fall to his death when he suddenly comes up with one last question. Suspicious, he asks the imposter to take off his glasses, and the man behind the wall starts to panic. He he knows whatever might happen next could expose him as a liar, but he's come prepared. There's a paper filled with personal information about the kid, including his prescription, but this won't help outsmart the thief. Zero here asks him to look at the symbols on the frame of the glasses and tell him what it says. The guy insists the words have been worn away, and that's when the thief accuses him of lying. Earlier, he saw the text was still in the glasses when he found them on the ground, and that means this voice is lying to him. With the countdown reaching zero, the thief has to decide which of the remaining directions are safe when he hears another familiar voice. It's his old friend Kazuya from high school and is surprised that he's trapped with him in this death game. The guy urges the man to jump in his direction, insisting it's safe. He takes a step back to prepare for his jump when he suddenly notices something is wrong. The other player checks on him, trying to figure out why he stopped at the last second, but the man has a clever idea to figure out if he's walking into another trap. Putting his plan to action, he asks his friend if his shoes are pointing towards him, but Kazuya here has a problem. He can't see his friend's feet through the window slit and tells him it's safe to jump, but that was his biggest mistake. Zero reveals that he untied his shoelace, and if the man saw it, he would have stopped him. This means his vision was blocked by the wall, and it's clear Kazuya was trying to kill him. The player leaves the arena, and there are only two more directions left, but the assistant warns him it's about to get a lot harder. That's when he realizes that if the person behind the wall can't see below a certain point, then by placing the coin on the edge of the platform, he can figure out who's in the safe area because they should be able to see it. With his plan set, he he asks the next player what kind of coin he placed on the platform. The gangster insists that he can't tell because the metal is too shiny, but that's when a guard hands him a mirror so that he can cheat. Peeking over the wall, he's able to see what the coin is and correctly tells him that it's 50 yen. Okay, this guy is smart. He only had 10 seconds to look at the walls before the mask was put back on, but somehow it was enough time for him to realize that this opening here was not big enough to have a full view of his platform. If I'm being honest, this was a very risky strategy to use, because the only way we could guarantee the idea would work is if we know exactly how far away the wall is from us and how narrow the slit is. If the calculations are wrong, then the thief's plan would completely backfire, because the players would be able to see the coin and he would be convinced that the platform is safe. If it were me, I would rather play cautiously, choosing to not trust anything that comes out of their mouths and find a different way to figure out the solution. Now, this doesn't mean the other players aren't useful because we can actually trick them into helping us figure out if they're behind a wall or not. Once they start talking, they're all going to tell us they're in the safe zone, so I would make them prove it by asking them to walk to the very edge of their platform and talk to us from there. This would be something that's impossible to fake because we'll be able to hear the change in the position of their voice. Before we put the mask on, we could see there was a small window in the middle of the wall, so their voices would sound normal from here. But when they move to the edge, then their voices will get muffled because the sound is traveling through the metal wall. Even if they stretch their neck all the way around the side, we'll be able to hear them come in contact with the wall as they twist their body around, putting strain into their voice. It's not going to sound natural, and if we know what to expect, it should be a dead giveaway that they're telling a lie. As humans, we tend to rely on our sight so much that we underestimate how much spatial awareness we actually have from our sense of hearing. If we're paying attention and listening closely, this death game has given us the perfect environment to use sound to find the safe zone, and it might even be enough to break the game. By combining both strategies of clapping to hear the different reverberations, and then asking the players to move to the edge of their platform, we can confirm where the walls are and make it out of here alive. The thief suspects this direction might be the safe area, but he decides to place the coin on the other edge to make sure he's right. That's when the assistant enters, saying that she can't see without her contact lenses, but insists she's standing in the safe zone. He doesn't trust her, but knows they're trying to trick him and decides to test his theory. Placing his coins back on the first
first edge. He asks the gangster what he's put down, and the man answers the question correctly, but it's way too fast. Earlier, the guy said it was too shiny to see, and took longer to respond. The only thing that makes sense is that he must have a tool to look over the wall, and coming up with a brilliant idea, he places the coin down at an angle against this metal stud, asking if it's heads or tails. The gangster takes a peek, and the woman tries to stop him from answering, but it's too late. He guessed correctly, proving that he can only see it from above, and the thief jumps off the platform, landing on the safe zone where the old man is waiting for him. The chairman congratulates him for winning and invites him forward, but this is all a trick. There's a secret hatch that's open in the platform, and one wrong step will send Zero falling to his death. The guy is about to walk forward, but makes it clear he already knew this was a trap and takes off his mask. He refuses to continue playing this sick game, but the old man warns him he can easily order the thief's death if he steps out of line. He's taken back to the ground level as the next round is prepared, and he notices staff members walk in with more mirrors. Zero demands to know what is happening, and the guard explains that in order to take away the next player's advantage, they will give the tools to everyone behind the wall from the beginning of the game. To make matters worse, the gangster has been sent to convince the student that he's in the safety zone, making it harder to believe him. Seeing the kid head to the elevator with a mask on, the man runs over and stops the doors from closing. He warns Shirube not to jump if he wants to live, and throws down his coins, but the thief is pushed away before he can say anything more. Suddenly, the guards drag him and his friends into a cell, but as they're locked inside, one of the kids asks what the warning was about. The man carves out the words on the wall, and they realize one of them is the Japanese word for mirror backwards. This combined with the coins was a clue that there were three mirrors the kid had to be careful of, but that's when a staff member enters the room, announcing the student has already beaten the game. Leaving the room, the thief asks the gangster how the kid won so quickly, but the guy only agrees to answer if the man promises to return the favor. With no other choice, the thief agrees, and the gangster explains that when Shirube was on the platform, he had bowed down in each direction, asking the person on the other side if the tip of his thumbs were flush against each other or separated. This way, he guaranteed the players couldn't see what the answer was, and all it took was the gangster answering his question correctly to find the safe zone. It's incredibly resourceful, and as he leaves the building, he sees the kid walk away as his teammates take their prize. This student has gained the support of more players, making him the biggest threat in the game, and that's two games down with five more to go. Okay, this student figured out how to play this game faster than anyone else, and it was genius. Both Zero and Shirube realized that the players behind the walls had limited sight, but the student knew how to take advantage of it a lot better than anyone else. If we know that they have to look through this slit to see what's in front of them, then by blocking their direct view, we know they won't be able to see from any other angle. However, if we block the same view from the person in the safety zone, they can bend down or lay on the ground to look up from a different perspective. Now, it's important to point out that this solution is and foolproof. If the other players were thinking quickly, they might have been able to use the mirrors to view his thumbs from underneath. If one person behind the wall answered the question correctly, it would be enough to destroy Shirube's plan and he would be tricked into jumping towards a wall. With this in mind, it would have been smarter to take more time and come up with a backup plan by clapping to hear the reverberations, helping us confirm which platform is safe. Now as for the chairman, this guy is downright evil. Zero here won the game, but even though he's done everything that was asked of him, the man is still trying to get him killed. It's completely unfair, but if I'm being honest, this was a horrible strategy. They used a long pole to pretend that he was standing up next to him, but the first problem is that we've never seen the man get out of his wheelchair. As far as we know, he's completely unable to stand, and it's enough reason to think this might be a trick. Secondly, he's talking to us from further away, and it would be extremely obvious that he's not standing right next to us, because his voice is coming from another direction. Direction. Now, if they're trying to kill us even after winning, it's not hard to figure out that we aren't their first choice candidate to become the new chairman. That means if we can negotiate so that both parties get what they want, then we won't have to worry about the staff members trying to trick us outside of the death games. If it were me, I would make a deal with them that if I win, I will surrender the chairman position to whoever their first choice is in exchange for keeping the 100 billion yen reward. This way I can leave this theme park with the money to last me the rest of my life. The next morning, the gangster walks into the group's tent, revealing that the thief signed up to a three-player game last night with his brother, Segi, as the third teammate. Together, they head to the entrance of a challenge called the Triangle Maze and walk inside with no idea this will be the hardest game yet. The group is led into a triangular room with a security camera mounted to the wall, but inside is another room, and the thief discovers a stand in the corner with dice inside. They're told to each roll a die, and after checking the results, the staff members instruct Zero to stand next to this pole. Worried, the thief obeys,
face, but then the guys immediately handcuff him to it before leaving the room. That sort of voice in the loudspeaker announces this will be a competition between several teams, and everyone has been locked inside a triangle-shaped room. Their goal is to answer a single question using this tablet, and have a choice of 25 different answers, but only one of them is correct. Suddenly, a plastic tank rises up on the ground and surrounds the thief. As the assistant explains, this will fill up with water in 30 minutes. The person trapped inside will act as a human clock to show how much time is left, and the water will only be drained when any team gives the correct answer, but each group can only answer once. With that, water is pumped into the tank and the game begins. Acting quickly, the gangster writes out the question and shows it to the thief, revealing that it says all the rooms are the same. What are you? It's clearly a riddle, and the gangster wants to show Zero the tablet, but Seiki here will only help after 25 minutes. That's how long it'll take for the man to drown inside of the tank, and he'll do anything to eliminate the competition. It's terrifying, and the thief insists he'll do anything so long as he survives, but the water is getting higher, and they're running out of time. Thinking about it, he suggests the shape of the room is a clue, and reminds them that all the other rooms are triangles as well, so there must be something they've missed. The players look around, and the gangster realizes he can use this dice holder to break the tank, but as he goes to pick it up, the man discovers something strange. Written on the ground are the letters A-O, and the brother draws the symbols on a sketch pad before showing them to the thief. Thinking quickly, he tells his teammate to check the other corners in the room, and the gangster discovers that the symbols don't appear anywhere else. But as the man returns, he declares he's figured out the answer. Taking the tablet, he selects C as his choice, pointing out that Ao sounds like the Japanese word for blue, and it reminds him of the ocean. Confident, the man is about to confirm his answer when the thief interrupts him. He explains that the symbol isn't a word, but represents something else, and quickly tells the gangster to draw a triangle with a curve in one of the corners. That's when he realizes that the AO symbols represent an acute angle, and that means they need to calculate the dimensions of this room to answer the question. Zero knows they can still find the length of each wall, and tells the others to count the panels. They work together, and Seiki here draws out the measurements, helping the thief understand they're inside a giant isosceles triangle made up of two separate rooms. Based on the dimensions, the angles must be 36 degrees in the opposite corners, but they have no idea what to do with this information, and there are only 10 minutes left before the man drowns. Okay, this is not an easy puzzle to solve. The smartest person in the room is tied up in a water tank, and the only people who have control of choosing the answers are two gangsters who want to eliminate their competition. They have no idea what the right answer is, and time is running out fast. Now, you might be thinking that if there are 25 possible answers, a good strategy would be to eliminate the ones that we know are wrong, and it might give us a better idea of how to find the solution. The problem with this strategy is that it's very easy to toss out the right answer by mistake, and we'll be wasting our time trying to solve the puzzle with the wrong information. It's way too risky to remove answers from consideration, and that's why we have to do our best to come up with a strategy first before checking to see if any of the answers support our theory. The benefit here is that there are two people outside of the tank, and we also have a cup in the room that's holding dice. If it were me, I would plan ahead and instruct this gangster here to break off the dice cup and start scooping out water from the tank. The game has a time limit of 30 minutes, but Zero here will drown in only 25 minutes. If his teammate can remove enough water, it will buy Zero an extra 5 minutes to help find the answer, and this can make the difference between winning or losing. Now, as far as the solution goes, we have to take the most obvious signs in the room and use them to figure out what they mean. The biggest factor to consider here is that the room is a triangle, because it's simply not normal. The only reason it would be shaped this way is if it's relevant to the solution. Using the same logic, this angle symbol confirms to us that geometry is important in this game, and it provides us a working theory for how to evaluate which answers are more likely to be correct. Now, the question we have to answer says, all the rooms are the same, what are you? It's clearly directing focus on what we are in relation to all the other rooms, and is obvious by the way it's phrased. With this in mind, knowing that all other rooms are shaped just like ours, we can see that there are only a few answers here that have triangles in their geometry. Possible answers are the sun, a windmill, a star, and a diamond, because each of these can be formed with triangles of the same shape and size. These four answers support our working theory, and that's why I would use the rest of my time drawing out these shapes to calculate the angles and figure out which of them is most likely to be correct. Things are getting tense, and the thief knows there must be more to this challenge than what they're seeing. Every single game in the past has tricked them in some way, and that's when Seiki here gets impatient, insisting they should randomly choose an answer. The thief refuses, arguing he can figure it out, but they need the gangster to understand why the math is important. That way, he'll come up with an out-of-the-box solution and help them complete the challenge. The thief 
Steve begins breaking down the math, explaining that all three angles should add up to 180 degrees. If two corners of the big room are both 36 degrees, then the remaining angle must be 108. Combine that with the angles of the other room, it adds up to 180 degrees. And after doing some calculations, the gangster finally understands the math. Excited, the thief instructs him to help solve the answer, but there's a problem. With only about four minutes left, the people in the tank will drown, and the other teams are beginning to panic. Terrified of losing, each group chooses the wrong answer until the only players left are Zero and Shirube. Meanwhile, the gangster is getting frustrated trying to understand what's so important about the angle being 36 degrees until he suddenly comes up with an idea. 3 plus 6 equals 9, and that reminds him of the card game Kabu. It's the Japanese word for turnip, which is typically cut into slices, just like the rooms are divided into separate pieces. They quickly check the tablet, and are surprised to find that turnip is one of the answers available. That's when the thief gets a brilliant idea, and points out the question refers to the shape of all the rooms combined. If all the rooms have the same measurements, then dividing 360 degrees by 36 should equal 10. That's the total number of rooms involved in this game, and whatever shape they're arranged in from above must be the answer. Based on the math, he figures they're inside a decagon, but when the rooms are combined, they would form a star. The brother grabs the tablet and is about to input the answer when the thief realizes he might be wrong. At the last second, he demands they show him their choices again, and the gangster holds it up to his face. It's just as the thief suspected, and he insists the real answer to the question is windmill. If it's a star, the layouts of the room wouldn't be facing the same way, but they do if it's arranged like a windmill. And with the solution discovered, the gangster selects the answer. If they get this wrong, everyone in the tanks will drown, but luckily, the tablet notifies them that it's correct. That makes three games down, with only four more to go. They've beaten the puzzle, and the water starts to drain as the handcuffs snap off from the poles. The players have been released, but the thief still hasn't gained consciousness. Segi here is impressed with the thief's commitment, and deciding to save him, the gangster resuscitates the man until he finally wakes up. That's when the assistant enters the room to congratulate him for winning, and brings out his reward, but makes it clear his empathy won't be enough to survive. With his prize in hand, he leaves the venue and finds his friends waiting outside, and makes him realize they were not only playing in the other rooms, but that he saved their lives once again. The friends celebrate, but there are still four more games left until someone beats this tournament, and soon, they'll discover just how deadly these games can get. But what do you think? How would you beat Zero the Bravest Money Game? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.